in the lion's den. Every chapter begins with a historical quote, and this is the one from chapter one. And then came the outbreak, which had been so often foretold, so often menaced, and the ground reeled under the nation. John Bright, member of parliament and friend of the union, from the speeches of John Bright on the American question. Charles Francis Adams curled his fingers around the armrest of the ancient mahogany chair, feeling for the familiar hidden groove on the wooden underside. He sat erect and still, as his mother had taught him during dark, snowy afternoons in Russia, when winter's cocoon confined them to the solemn embassy for months. But his fingertips betrayed the anxiety under his exterior calm. The chair had been at the White House since his father was president. Generations of politicians and other favor seekers had camped on the Regency velvet until the brown backing showed through, the fo through, showed through like the fallow field in Quincy, mown close to the sod. The emerald plush of the armrest was dry stubble now. The president's living allowance must be as puny as ever. Charles found and silently traced the deep scratch he had worried countless times as a student, waiting for his father to invite him into the book-lined office and deepening the crack as only a bored child would. He was hardly that disheveled youngster anymore. Wearing a finely stitched suit from London, Charles was nearly as old as his father, John Quincy, had been when he labored in the White House. At 53, Charles was two years older than the man who kept him waiting like a boy now. Charles bit the inside of his lip, a nervous habit that others couldn't see. He hoped more intensely than he would have acknowledged even to Abby, who knew him better than anyone but his father, long dead, that the time would be well spent. Not even his diary, the ledger he kept with the hope, but little confidence that future generations would read it, recorded this selfish wish. He had anticipated the moment his whole life. Year after year, dreading the catastrophe, he still ached for the opportunity to prove himself. At last, the summons to history had arrived. It had been delayed so long that he almost ceased expecting it. Now, to distract himself, he concentrated on the flaw that meandered under his fingertips like the Charles River winding through cobblestone Boston. The door to the office opened abruptly. President Lincoln will see you, Mr. Adams, William Seward announced, poking his head through. Seward's words were as formal as his black bull suit, but he angled his eyebrow and flashed Charles a quick smile as he opened the door wide. Charles, he added sotto voce, waving toward the inner office with a genial flourish. Seward's bushy white hair struggled against the pomade he used to press it flat. The thick tufts reminded Charles of the pompadour crest on the barnyard rooster back home. His old friend was only Secretary of State, not President, as the abolitionists had expected. Yet he was still cock of the walk. William Seward let Lincoln stew in Washington's cookpot three long weeks before finally accepting the public offer of secretary. The brash New Yorker had enough nerve to equip two presidents. Charles knew no one in politics with as much self-assurance, and he envied it. Good morning, Mr. Adams, the president said, barely glancing up from a stack of letters as Charles entered the room. A sheaf of telegrams spilled across the corner of the desk, and Lincoln waved a long hand at a chair across from him. Take a seat, please. I'll be with you in a moment. He continued stabbing at the letters, signing his name in jerky bursts. Charles studied the obscure Westerner whom fate had elevated to the Republic's highest office. It was the first time he had seen Lincoln up close, aside from shaking hands in an, in an inaugural reception line. And he marveled anew, with no conscious disrespect, at the st strange debris kicked up by the wheels of the American political process. Lincoln's nomination had been a surprise. He had served one forgettable term in Congress a decade earlier, earlier, and was just as homely as the newspaper artist sketched him with a plain, plowed face. His beard softened the angular jaw, but it couldn't hide the deep furrows running under his prominent Indian cheekbones or the dark bruises around his sunken eyes. The man was as raw as the frontier. Lincoln made weather-beaten Andrew Jackson look like a Broadway dandy. 
Of all the presidents Charles had known, and he had known most of them, none seemed so unfinished. God help us, Charles thought. If appearances meant anything, the man was as fit to be president as the Quincy blacksmith, though perhaps less inured to the heat. Lincoln finally pushed aside the last letter with the tip of his index finger. He wore a black broadcloth coat tight across the shoulders, and his wrists stuck out from the cuffs. Angled sideways to fit his knees, Lincoln sat at the Louis the Sixteenth table like he would have at a school desk. The spacious office shrank around the gangly Kentuckian, who now looked expectantly at Charles. Mr. Adams, Secretary Stewart tells me the Senate has accepted our uh, our nomination and your appointment as Minister to England. It looks like Congress has seen fit to give us our way, for once. Clasping his hands behind his head, the President leaned backward in a long, slow stretch. His cuffs heisted themselves home, higher on the bony wrists, and the buttons quivered against the strain, ready to pop. Charles noticed that one was sewn on with white thread, the other with brown. Lincoln's gray eyes bore down on the Massachusetts man, Charles wondered what plan Lincoln had devised for handling Great Britain. It would have to be ingenious. Charles leaned forward, deferent but poised. He knew he looked every bit the Boston Brahmin, for which most people took him, the elegant embodiment of America's only aristocracy and its severe Puritan rectitude. So it seems, sir, even the opposition hardly objected it was most gratifying, especially in light of our present circumstances, Charles paused. But Lincoln remained silent, watching. I would like to thank you for your confidence, Mr. President, and for the appointment, he continued. I've studied the issues closely. It will be tough to bring St. James to our side, but I believe we can do it. As you know, my father and grandfather occupied the same position. Charles stopped himself from, offering, from adding more the chronicler in him wanted to add that they too served in desperate times. Grandfather had bearded the British lion after the revolution and toasted the king who had threatened to hang him from a yard arm in Boston Harbor. Thirty years later, Charles' own father signed the peace treaty that ended the War of 1812, the second time that mighty paw had knocked America sprawling. Charles was third in his line to act as minister, as minister to the court of St. James, a direct descendant of the American Revolution. But he held his tongue. To anyone outside the family, it was ancient history. The Warren tale would reveal only vanity. Beware of pride, Charlie, grandfather had cautioned. Strive to be useful. God alone is our witness. Besides, Lincoln would be well aware of the family's long association with these matters. With his hand still clasped behind his head, the president now swiveled to look at William Seward, causing the chair's iron mechanism to bray in protest. The Secretary of State was studying a patch on the ceiling as if looking far into the future where no one else could see. Lincoln glanced from Seward to Adams, taking the measure of one man against the other. He then placed his hands back on the table with a deliberate air and responded, very kind of you to say so, Mr. Adams but there's no need to thank me. You're not my choice, you're Seward's man. I have no claim on you at all. Lincoln pursed his full lips, perhaps aware the statement was hardly a compliment, and then smiled. I reckon you'll do just fine, though, he added. England can't have much interest in our affairs. Huff, uh, when can you sail? Years of training repaid Charles in an instant. Dismay might have shown on a less controlled man, but he had governed the display of his emotions since the age of six. All the ladies in St. Petersburg had commented upon it, a miniature diplomat, old before he was out of short pants. The more intensely Charles felt, the more unemotional he appeared, as drum-tight as a Chinese cabinet.